Associate Professor from the Environmental Engineering Management Department of Energy, Environment and Climate Change, Asia Institute of Technology or AIT. And uh, um, even though we have uh, uh, um, used up uh, the time uh, earlier in this afternoon, uh, um, Gurmarat has uh, now trying to uh, regroup his presentation and we'll leave some time for, for uh, uh, Q&A, uh, any questions that you may have. And uh, Dr. Ekbedin, together with uh, my colleague, Dr. Anet Prashar Galmani, the Environmental Policy Planning and Compliance Division Manager from Bangja Corporation, uh, will help facilitate the questions and answers session. Um, so um, without any further ado, um, um, uh, may I request the honor of uh, having uh, Mr. Parat Goenka addressing us on this very interesting and very timely topic um, on, on decarbonization solution. Please, uh, 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 Kumarat. Uh, good, good afternoon, and uh, I would like to thank you, first of all, to invite me for this very prestigious discussion, because I do believe what uh, Thailand Markets Club is doing basically and highly focused on uh, you know future of the industry this is something which we need to do and uh, um, to to you know to help industry as well as decision makers to navigate their path so thank you for inviting me for this prestigious forum and i would specifically like to thank thank kun bloita kun panun kun kaman and uh, i would also like to uh, thank Dr. Egbodin for joining us uh, for this discussion. Uh, for this discussion on our side from Shell, I have my colleague Kun Turnstai, who actually helped coordinate this whole discussion. And um, uh, I, I will, I will actually mute. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. So, uh, and uh, I would also uh, like to tell you that I am joined here by, with my two colleagues, uh, Khun Chon Chai, uh, who helped coordinate this discussion, and Khun Pisak. Uh, both of them are based in uh, Bangkok, actually. So with this, um, I will start with my presentation. So uh, basically, uh, if we talk about what uh, world is looking for today is actually a better place for the better and more environmentally befitting env um, place for people to live. So, uh, and that's, I can say, on a very holistic platform. Uh, that's on very holistic platform. <clears throat> but to further granulate, what I intend to do is I want to share a few things what Shell is doing and what something which Shell is willing to offer and discuss with our customers and clients to help them decarbonize. So those will be the two components I would be discussing. Uh, this is just a slide, not an eye test, just to say that please don't make any investment decisions based on our presentation or don't buy any shares based on this presentation. If you have anything you like through this discussion, please contact us and we will have further discussions. That's very unique. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, what uh, I plan to discuss is that what is Shell's uh, powering progress strategy? And following that, I will also talk about what Shell is doing. At, it, it's one of its uh, flagship refineries in Pernis in Rotterdam. So these are two things which are more like examples of what Shell is doing. And uh, after that, I will propose a small break and some Q&A. And after that, I'll move to the next segment where we will talk about what, what Shell catalysts and technologies has it in offering. Specifically talk, talking about few technologies very focused on uh, decarbonization. Uh, then I'll speak about CO2 utilization options, decarbonization pathways, and a quick summary of our discussion. So that, that would be uh, today's content. I'm just moving on to <clears throat> the very first segment and uh, you know, just to set the background, I'm sure all the people in this meeting are 
very well versed with the needs of environmental change. But just to set the background and our view around it, I just want to say that the, if you see this graphics, what we feel is that the number of people on the planet is going to go up almost to 9.8 billion from current 7.6. And energy demand is expected to increase by a third. On the other hand, we are looking at CO2 equivalent, which needs to be reduced to almost half. So which means we are looking at higher population, higher energy demand, but reduction of um, CO2 footprint. And this Paris Agreement sets a goal of holding the rise in global temperature well below two degrees Celsius per century. And the Paris Agreement also said the world should pursue for 1.5. A uh, significant part of societies are now seeking to meet the higher emission levels. For example, multinational companies, certain countries, industrial sectors and individuals. And what we feel is that the urgency of meeting these goals is now going higher with every passing. I, I'm being cautious of my word, but I actually feel the heat nowadays when I discuss with my customers, my clients and peers that the the the, uh, the requirement urgency is going up by the day, not even by the months or years. And this is something I would like to talk about regulations and why talking about it, because sometimes some people feel there are not right now the regulations in our country and what we need to do right away. So I just want to granulate that uh, the need to do decarbonization comes from four different segments. The first one is basically social pressure where carbon disclosure schemes, sustainability matrices, increased noise from the mainstream media, social platforms, uh, basically push people to do decarbonization. Uh, there were terms like flight shaming, uh, which didn't even exist before, before 2018. So people are facing a lot of social pressure to reduce carbon emission. The second thing is investors pressure. So if we are looking for fundings from international organizations, sometimes now investors are coming back and telling what is your plan for decarbonization? What kind of CO2 footprint new projects are going to have? So which means that we need to be prepared with our decarbonization plans or the roadmap to be able to have access to those fundings. Uh, similarly, legislations on the right side, you will see there are few countries who have put together legislations. For example, Sweden says 2045, it is already in law to be net zero. But on the other hand, if we see countries like Japan or China, there is submission to UN, but there is not really a legislation right now. But what this shows is that no matter what we do, these legislations are going to come up today or tomorrow. And it would be better if we plan with our industry to do it in a planned way rather than doing in a haphazard way at the last moment. This is just a quick one on how we expect the energy mix of the globe to look. And if you will see, it looks very different in different regions. North America, if we look at, seems to be moving a lot towards solar and wind. And their overall energy demand is not expected to go up, particularly North America and Europe. But while if we look at Asia, if we look at our region, probably for two reasons. One, because of our population is going up and two, because our lifestyle is also imp improving because right now per capita CO2 emission in North America and Europe probably has already peaked, but Asia it is still increasing. So if you see, uh, we still expect that uh, there would be increase in um, energy requirement, but there would be also this migration and if you can see my cursor, despite of moving a huge volume to renewables, we might stay quite a bit dependent on nuclear and fossil fuel energy, which means that our way to address the energy transition would be different from the way our Western uh, counterparts might be doing. 
Uh, my one suggestion would be that if you would like to ask any question any point in time, don't wait for me to stop. I would be very happy to, you know, discuss it on the go. Yes, and you can also send it through the chat box and uh, we will help facilitate that. Yeah, that would be great. OK. So come to my pan tang chat box. Your team and the show facilitate. Hi. So this is and now I'm just moving very quickly to something which we call as what is Shell's powering progress strategy. If you see, we have multiple box here. What we feel, what we mean by powering progress, we mean by powering progress is generating value for our shareholders. It provides the financial strength to transform our company as the world makers makes the uh, transition to cleaner energy. I believe some things which are going, I'm going to say here are going to also apply for your organizations. It focuses on working with our customers and across sectors to accelerate the transition to net zero emissions. Instead with society, a net zero world is where society stops adding to the total amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Powering progress means powering lives and livelihoods through our products and activities and by supporting and inclusive society. So which in other words, we also believe that this new journey will also create new jobs and new livelihood sustainability. So it's not about taking away uh, jobs. It's about creating more, but in a structured manner to uh, not to increase uh, carbon footprint. It also means respecting nature by protecting environment, reducing waste and making a positive contribution to biodiversity. And, uh, and then we also talk about the power progressing is underpinned by our core values of honesty, integrity and respect for people and our focus on safety. These include our commitment to doing business in an ethical and transparent way. So this is kind of you can say Shell's overall powering progress uh, thought process. I'm just uh, moving to a very interesting section where I will uh, more speak about what our um, company is doing, particularly at one site. So one site is an example, but we have uh, we are kind of trying to achieve very similar things. We are trying to achieve uh, a project um, decarbonization through a project in um, in our Singapore refinery. We are looking at decarbonization of our assets in Australia. So which means that which wherever we are, we are already working on our decarbonization pathways. This is just one example of that. We are probably we are ahead of other projects. So what what is basically uh, Shell Purnish Refinery? Shell Purnish Refinery is a uh, one of the largest refineries of Shell uh, with a capacity of 400,000 barrels per day. Set up in 450 hectares, equivalent to 1,000 football fields. It is one of the high co complex um, refineries, complexly refineries, and can process many types of crude, uh, crudes. Uh, product slates include clean fuels and lubricants as well as chemicals. So probably that is also an indication of this refinery being a complex refinery. What we are trying to do is we are trying for Pernice into a transmission transformation to an integrated energy and chemical park that delivers low carbon products. So that's kind of you can say that's our objective of the decarbonization which we are doing in this refinery. So uh, just uh, talking about Shell Energy and Chemical Park in Lo uh, Rotterdam and what Pernis is transforming to. It will be known as from Shell Pernis to Shell Energy and Chemical Park Rotterdam. And Pernis isn't the only Shell refinery that is transforming in this way. Shell is turning its refineries around the world into lower carbon sites that are that can respond better to changing future demands. The key is integration, and we are concentrating on our portfolio into six sites, mainly around US Gulf Coast, Northwest Europe, and Singapore. You will see that the product portfolio is changing, which is necessary as we seek to reduce the carbon intensity of the product. 
we sell. This will mean selling more hydrogen, more biofuels, and more renewable energy. In addition, as a business that supplies energy, we will work with sectors that use energy like aviation, heavy freight ship, heavy freight and shipping, and we will help them to find their own path to net zero. Why uh, we are working with industry is that when you look at industry, not everybody can achieve net zero in the same way, number one. And number two, it may not be possible for each industry to migrate to bio or uh, biofuels or regenerable fuels. So we want to work together with them to find out what is the most optimal pathway is. So uh, some of uh, Bernice activities are, uh, if, as you can see, these are into three main buckets and I will talk about it later on in our offering also. But three things which we are uh, talking about is that we will reduce emission from our own operations, including the production of oil and gas by increasing energy efficiency and capturing or offsetting any remaining emissions. Emissions from our own em uh, from our operations make up less than 10% of total emissions. So which means that for us, our own emissions is one part, but the resultant emission from the fuels we produce is also something we want to look at. The most of our emissions come from use of energy as well. So we must also help our customers cut their emissions when they use the energy. Importantly, our target includes emission not only from energy we produce and process ourselves, but also from all the energy products that other products and we sell to our customers. And here we have some of decarbonization activities that are in our pathway. Across the top are the three classical pathways through, with, uh, through which Shell intends to decarbonize. We will reduce emissions from our own operations. We will capture, we will be capturing or, or offsetting any remaining emissions. And most of our emissions come from use of um, Sorry, and uh, you know, uh, and the next part, if you will look at it, is that we are migrating to green hydrogen. Green hydrogen we will produce either from wind or from uh, solar. Though, if you will see the Rotterdam area, we are more working on wind wind farms, and also we have shell renewable refining process which we are implementing. I'll speak about it in next slide, and then. Now let's say we increase the efficiency, we change the fuel type, but still there would be some residual emissions, some residual emission coming from stacks. So that's what we want to do here is to capture that CO2 and sequester it. So these are kind of three buckets uh, we are focusing at. Um, so if you look at making low carbon, <clears throat> energy products from 100% biofeed. This is one of the major focuses which we have. And th in this, the first step is that the feedstock, which arrives uh, through the barges, but which is something like cooking oil, animal fat, vegetable oil, or agricultural residue. So it can be any kind of bio-based. Uh, and then uh, those waste feedstock will consist uh, those uh, basically those waste feedstocks are not something which is competing with food chain. So that is something important we want to speak about here is that we are not targeting those feedstocks which might compete with uh, food uh, food stock need of the increasing population of the world. Once the food uh, uh, feedstock arrives, we have the pretreatment to remove impurities from the feedstock. Then we uh, move to HEFA plant, basically, uh, which features the shell renewable refining process, where we produce renewable naphtha, renewable diesel, and renewable kerosene. And from here, we move on to the CO2 produced. Uh, the, the CO2 produced in the process is then captured using uh, Shell's Edit Ultra technology and transported to be stored underneath the Northern Sea in a depleted gas field. 
a dedicated hydrogen unit further reduces reduces the carbon intensity of production process and end products and now these low uh, lower carbon fuels are ready to be sold to the customers or shipped helping the decarbonize uh, decarbonization of aviation shipping or road transportation um i have couple of more slides after that i plan to pause but if you would want me to pause i can take a pause at this moment um should uh could work continue or any of the participant has any comments or questions um Dr. Ekbadin, do you want to share comments or anything like that? Now, there is no one. 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 I think we, we can proceed. You can proceed. Thank you very much. But very, very uh, interesting uh, background setting. And, and, you know, again, you know, being uh, with Bang Jat and we also operate a, a small refinery. Uh, this is very interesting to see how you can become a low carbon uh, refinery or, or almost a, a, a zero carbon refinery in the future. Thank you very much. So this is a little bit I'm talking about the shell re renewable refining process, which we have implemented uh, into the into the Purdis refinery. It is something very uh, similar to uh, what I spoke about. So first, the uh, the feedstock arrives, and there is a unique pretreatment added uh, into the process uh, to reduce, uh, you know, risk to reduce the contaminants or the um, or the oxygenates going into the first stage of hydrogen hydrogenation process. So. First step is we use the pretreatment process. This is a new unit added to the existing asset. Then we have hydrogenation and hydro deoxidation process, uh, deoxygenation process, which is basically happening into our existing uh, unit. And uh, we can process in this, this unit various kinds of feeds with different type of exosomes. We remove poisons, CO and CO2 for enhanced second stage performance. So this is the kind of, uh, you can say, the stages which are there for uh, renewable refining process. Uh, then we move into uh, the second stage, which is hydroisomerization. Uh, I'm sure you would be aware why we need to do hydro hydroisomerization. But uh, just to add to that is hydroisomerization is primarily required to do so that we can improve the viscous uh, the the flowability of the of the fuels uh, or in another way uh, words you can say the viscosity in index if uh, with which we can manage and then in the end we go to an existing stripper and we get a renewable diesel and jet fuel out of it so this is kind of a combination of few sections being new and few assets being used from the existing refinery so uh, if you see the furnace bias fuel uh, unit will probably have the lowest carbon intensity of any hefa um, i'm sure you know hefa but hefa is hydro processed ester and fatty, uh, fatty acids so uh, it is it would be uh, the lowest carbon intensity hefa worldwide and uh, what we do is we are using partly renewable hydrogen the HIFA's uh, hydrogen unit will be provided by a new hydrogen plant. Most of the power supply comes from the process residue gases, which originate from renewable process. So which means that there is a renewable process which is generating certain off gases, which are, you can say, orphan gases or uh, which are gases, gases of low uh, energy, but high chemical value. So we use that chemical value to bring to produce hydrogen uh, from these off gases. And this results in much lower carbon intensity than regular hydrogen. However, this process in the end still emits little bit of CO2, which we will capture using Edip Ultra and uh, store under the North Sea. So, and uh, this is basically the last part of the same thing, last component, where 
um, Shell is actually one of the four companies who will supply uh, CO2 to, to the Porthos uh, collective pipeline. This is the collective pipeline in storage where you, you can see multiple industries are working together. There is a subsea pipeline and then sequestration at the site. Uh, the CO2 will be pumped into an empty gas field approximately three kilometers beneath the North Sea. Storage facilities, 2 million tons per annum of CO2. FRD is already taken in 2022, and we expect this to be operational in 2024. What will this result in? This will help reduce furnace CO2 emission by 25%, and which is in terms of tonnage, we will reduce 1.15 million ton per year of CO2 for 15 years, because uh, 15 years from two perspective, one based on the capacity of sink, and uh, also from the perspective that in 15 years, we will be also working on other past pathways to reduce our CO2 emission. This process is using shell gasification, hydrogen production process, and shell renewable refining process. We spoke about renewable refining process, in my second segment, I will also talk about shell gasification process. Uh, so <clears throat> this is kind of like last slide. So it is about offtake agreement from Holland's cast uh, wind farms, which enables shell to supply power via a 250 megawatt uh, PPA to an anchor customer in support of its decarbonization objectives. Trade power on the open market to serve additional customers, or we can use it for Shell's own use. Power a 200 megawatt electrolyzer. Electrolyzer for hydrogen. So hydrogen plays a balancing role as an energy storage solution to increase system resilience. By anchoring demand on Shell Pernis, we support the development of green hydrogen infrastructure for the cracking sector, and Porto CCS adds optionality of enabling blue hydrogen. So this is kind of, uh, you can say, it is not something we are doing in isolation within our own complex. We are working with our neighbors, with different type of industries, and uh, with different entities to make an integrated hub, uh, which is kind of dependable upon each other and also helps um, managing the uh, what is the right word it also helps uh, balancing the uh, the uh, balancing the availabilities and demands from different sectors um, so um, this is where i am i would mm -hmm. certainly suggest that we take you know a short break otherwise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it would be too much of downpouring of information <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. Uh, um, at the, at this point, I think uh, now we can see, you know, how 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 what what we've we've been hearing about decarbonizing, you know, the the energy industry now is is really in the making, and and there are so many components, and also you cannot do it in isolation, and of course uh, this one is is heavily relying upon uh, technology, and uh, Shell of course is 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 leading in in all the all the technologies that we are talking about you know we we see green hydrogen here blue hydrogen we see uh, ccs we see subsea uh, uh, um, uh, carbon capture and, and storage uh, do i understand correctly that that the the uh, the subsea ccs where you'll be uh, storage storing the the uh, carbon dioxide emission uh, uh, is formerly uh, a shell on uh, 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 petroleum fuels it's it's a jointly owned pet, uh, field now, mm -hmm. uh, jointly owned by four companies now. Okay, okay. It's not mm -hmm. solely ours. Uh, you know, uh, Kun Gloita, the one of the challenges which right now um, are still there and which is still under uh, discussion are that once we sequester this CO two, mm. whose responsibility does it become? Exactly. Yes. That that's what the, that that's my next question. That's why I asked you know whether the the petroleum field belongs to Shell only or you know, uh, somebody else, and after that, who owns the carbon? Yeah, so <laughs> that's why you said there, uh, as you saw there, I used about fifteen years yes. because we really don't know if we can remain 
uh, responsible for and honestly we don't have answer for it right now mm -hmm. but uh, if you see we cannot remain responsible for it for the lifetime after 15 years after 20 years because of some kind of geographical movement some kind of earthquake some kind of you know natural thing calamities or maybe some kind of a new industrial transformation because of which we again start digging some bells mm -hmm. we cannot remain liable and towards this co2 yes and here <laughs> we are not sequestering only our co2 we are sequestering co2 from multiple industries sure. then mm -hmm. when we are sequestering industry uh, uh, co2 from multiple industries what is the legislation i exactly. think still in framing probably uh, pernis or rotterdam site will teach us Mm -hmm. and um, teach first probably Netherlands people and probably later on to globe how to look at it from the legislative perspective. Mm -hmm. I, I think we, we, we're still learning, you know, if, if each and every one of us. This is so new to, to the world. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here. What is the most realistic time frame to look forward to for the development and integration of hydrogen infrastructure? at the national, regional, and global levels? Um, I, let, uh, I will maybe expect part of answer to come from you, but I will start. <laughs> by, by, OK. I, I will start with the answer. Mm -hmm. So uh, right now, if uh, I speak about what is happening on global level, so global level, what is happening is that there are few countries which produce natural gas or oils. There are few countries which are more consumers. Mm -hmm. So which are kind of the scope, one emission of few countries is scope three emission of some other countries. But the countries which are more consumers and emitting CO2 may not have uh, CO2 sequestration sites near them. And this CO2 might be required to go back to the countries from where we kind of receive the natural uh, fuel, uh, uh, the fossil fuels in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Now, how those countries' organizations are looking at it, and I can tell you I was in, in Australia last week, mm -hmm. and I will not say which company, but there was a news in the media because one of the companies is looking at sequestering CO2 from Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, bring that CO2 and sequester it into the north of uh, Australia. Australia. And there was some media news where it was saying, oh, now, by the way, this company wants to bring garbage of the whole world and dump it in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. okay. so, uh, so in another words, which, what I'm trying to say here is that when we talk about globally, there are those synergies which need mm. to be worked out. How we look at, you know, mov movement of those, um, those cargos from one part of the planet to the other mm -hmm. part. Uh, I think the policies are still in making. Uh, yes. The only question mark which everybody's minds is that how how much these fields are reliable because few fields we know are very sure. reliable. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the ones which come from de depleted gas sources or aquifers which come from de depleted gas core sources, we know they can be capped and they are very well protected. But then we are talking about so many other storages where we don't know how much is actually storing capacity and mm -hmm. if can leak from some other part of the uh, soil uh, if mm. we the red one side. Yeah, uh, over to you, Kunglata. Okay, I, I think even from, I mean, now the technology is still very expensive, to, so to speak, right? So, uh, and, and countries like Thailand, we are at a very early stage, and there are companies like uh, PTTEP, who is uh, spearheading in this, and they have uh, uh, their oil field in the Gulf of Thailand. Um, for like the likes of Bang Chang ourselves, we, we are learning. We, we've invested in a, a, a hydrogen startup in the UK. And uh, now it's, it's, it's only a, a learning curve, curve for, for, for everyone. Uh, 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 so at, at the national level, I, I know that the, the government would also like to push for this technology and, and perhaps using PTTEP as uh, the government um, for, for this uh, first pilot uh, in the Atit field in the Gulf of, of Thailand. And, 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 uh, but uh, other than that, I think uh, that's why you know, Carbon Markets Club has been set up as a bridge 
uh, between you know uh, transitioning from fossil fuel uh, to to a much a cleaner uh, uh, fuel because we know that you know technology will take uh, you know, transition will take not only time but also will be quite costly so in the meantime why we try to uh, transitioning from from fossil based fuels to to clean energy you know uh, carbon credits trading is is uh, one thing that will help facilitate that uh, Dr. Eberdin, you have any any uh, comments to make, please? Yeah, so I, I think, yeah, thank you very much. It's very, um, very useful information. I think um, we one of the questions that I have is uh, at the beginning, I think you introduced the case study, right, in, in, uh, yeah, in your location. Yeah, and then the original those um, refinery is not designed for for the no. used oil, right? No. So meaning that there are a lot of retrofit need to be done. Yeah, so we, uh, yeah, it's a way you can say retrofit or sometimes nowadays we are more working using a word called repurposing the refinery. Uh. Um, because uh, for uh, repurposing, we need some kind of modifications to be done. And uh, you would be aware that oxygenates are not very, uh, very good to go into our refinery units because uh, we, we cannot put them in the end product. So that becomes one of the things when we are looking at lignostic or cellulistic biomasses, then to you know convert them into, uh, into a form where we are not harming our main refining process. Yeah, and then in that case, I think in some of your slide also talking about utilization, but with this refinery, I think you use only the capture and storage, right? So why why not consider about some utilization? Uh, I'll I will certainly address your answer um, when I go to the next segment. Okay. We are talking about, but maybe I'll I'll pick it up right now. You know what is happening is CO two is an extremely stable molecule. It's and you know to break it back into any kind of utilization module means we have to put in a lot of energy. So which means that we have to look at economics of the process. That's where probably Kungloita was also talking about that. One thing which we are looking at is in the end, making it uh, commercially attractive. Uh, there are a lot of options. I'm not going to talk a lot of options today, but I will touch upon a few of them today and how we are looking at them. Thank you. Okay, so thanks. I think maybe I keep some of the questions yes. for the next session. <laughs> so now, because your questions may be what uh, Kun Bharat is planning to cover anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Very, very interesting and, and you know, very, very eye opening, really. You know, a lot, a lot, lot of things. The only thing which I would say is that we are in this journey together with you. Yes, exactly. I, I would not say that Shell has um, lot of solutions yes we are working on solutions we might be ahead of by few months with few industries or maybe you know together with the few but we are not like it's not a journey where we can say we are 20 years ahead of others okay yes and it's the world of collaboration you know yes. everyone everyone's footprint is everyone's footprint now exactly you cannot go net zero alone right exactly very true okay so please, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So uh, moving on to the next segment, uh, I am just going to speak about this slide, uh, which I feel is uh, one interesting slide. A lot of things happening still in development stage. And uh, this is something where we are talking about what all can be done in different uh, ways. So on the left side, if you will see, these are uh, all the kind of waste or pollutants or the things which uh, we want to utilize in one way or another. And on the right side are our aspired products. If you will see between the left and right, there are very few lines which are fully hard lines. There are many lines which are dotted. So what is dotted means is Dotted lines are where we are at low TRL or technologies under development, uh, whether with Shell or with a third party. Doesn't mean that all those technologies are offering from us, but very broadly speaking, these are the different pathways 
uh, we are looking at. And probably I'll start with one which we just spoke about a few minutes ago, which is vegetable oil and animal fat. If you will see, um, uh, we start with it, we do a pre-treatment, we use the shell refi renewable refining process, and we make kind of renewable naphtha, sustainable aviation fuel, or renewable diesel. We spoke about it a few minutes ago, so I will not spend too much time, but this is one pathway. The second pathway is co-processing. So difference between co-processing and SRRP is that in co-processing, we will do some very uh, small addition to the refinery, for example, 10% uh, of the biofuels. We will pre-treat it, and then we will put it into the uh, existing uh, refining, let us say, diesel hydro treaters or VGO hydro treaters, and it gives us same product in the refinery, but we can consider it as low carbon intensity because part of the feedstock comes from vegetable oil. So these are the two things very focused on uh, refineries. Then the next one is a little bit related to petrochemicals, where we are talking about plastics. Um, you know, we are talking about plastic circularity everywhere. So plastic circularity is in multiple ways. One way of doing plastic circularity is that you take, let us say, you collect the whole polypropylene, you melt and, you know, reshape into new polypropylene products and use it. So that is something which industry is doing. Here we are talking about is more from a, a molecular level where you collect the plastics, different kind of plastics. You do primary plastic conversion, which is more like a pyrolysis, uh, pyrolysis pro process of collected plastics. Put it into a recovered plastic upgrader. Why recovered plastic upgraded? Because the pyrolysis product is very refractory in nature and it cannot be fed to the steam cracker directly. So it is stabilized and it is upgraded. And after upgradation, it is put into existing steam crackers. And from existing steam crackers, this is kind of well-defined path where we can make uh, ethane, ethylene, um, sorry, C2s and C3, it lean and prop lean from, from these processes. So, which means that from used plastic, we are trying to make a pathway to get a new feed for our existing steam crackers. Uh, the next one, so, you know, this is a technology where uh, we have advanced to a reasonable stage and uh, we uh, do feel that it would be further uh, further um, commercialized. The other thing which can which can be done here is that this pyrolysis oil can be sent for shell gasification process, which means that it is the same gasification process, but we don't start from a fossil fuel, but we start from a fuel which is kind of a waste or a recycled product. And from here, we can produce, go for fissure crop production, uh, fissure crop process, or we can actually produce blue hydrogen also. It is a very busy slide, so all dots are not there, but shell gasification can also be used for shell blue hydrogen production or blue hydrogen production. Then we talk about real waste, for example, municipal solid waste carrying less than 10% plastics or lignocellulistic uh, lignocellus biomass. So for example, wood, wood shops, these are the products which we can use in an integrated hydropyrolysis and hydro treatment. So that is why we call it IH square, hydropyrolysis and hydro treatment process. This is a, a unit which we are operating on a demo level, almost five tons per day in India, in our own office in Shell Technology Center, Bangalore. And uh, this process gives directly sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel naphtha and diesel and the conversion is conversion to these fuels is approximately 40 percent normally we you we get some ash content which can be used as mixed into fertilizers and manure so which means that this process by itself is not a process which further creates additional um, 
emission uh, treatment emission uh, and which creates additional emission so it is kind of a process which doesn't contain can uh, produce much of new waste or emission um, then we talk about other options to use lignocellulosic biomass i'm little bit moving one step below i am going to shell fiber conversion technology this is a established technology particularly used in americas for uh, corn fields where we get distillers corn oil which can be directly fed into shell renewable re refining process so this is kind of a process which is fully established line in americas uh the question again is to make sure that whatever we do we do not compete with the food chain we do not uh start taking away the food from humans uh, while trying to create a cleaner environment so that's that's very clear uh, process we are uh, following uh the other option is actually uh, we can do a primary uh, biomass conversion and put it into ih square process so it is it is just an additional process this process is under development again for making better feed for ih square i'm taking a few seconds pause uh, for uh, everyone to digest this information before i go to the captured part or the part which we are talking a lot nowadays from uh, from the industry so uh, i spoke about right now all the things which are either biomass biofuels or the Uh, municipal waste or plastic waste so waste to uh, renewable products and with this i will move to uh, the bottom segment where we are talking about uh, you know co2 we you know we have there are few industries for example steel cement even sometimes we consider power generation but alumina these are the industries which tend to emit co2 uh, which will continue to emit co2 because for example if we talk about a uh, cement kiln even if we put all renewable energy inside it the process by itself will continue to emit co2 similarly a few slides before we saw that even in shell furnaces even after doing all the renewable things we were still left with some uh, residual uh, residue co2 now what to do with this co2 so this co2 we suggest to use uh, we have two different amine technologies for capturing of co2 we can capture up to 95% of co2 from emission um, emission or vent lines and this co2 is kind of 99% pure this co2 right now we are talking about methanation process so you take co2 and you take green hydrogen to make methane so you can say we get kind of green methane we are also talking about co2 to reverse water gas shift to produce co so which means co2 gets converted to co and then we add hydrogen to it to make synthesis gas which can be used in fisher trop process and once we have fisher trop process or once we have synthesis gas we can do so many things we can produce fertilizers from it we can produce uh, lubricants we can produce naphtha aviation fuels renewable, renewable diesel uh, so it this fisher trop gives multiple options so which means the challenge here is that we already have a good pure co2 we have a process to use carbon monoxide and hydrogen right now we are working on this process which is kind of um, converting this co2 into co and add green hydrogen to it may, may i interrupt here and ask a uh, cost wise you know it is it uh, uh, you know something that is a uh, um investable now or is it something that you see you know we we need to to wait for a few more years to make it a uh, uh, um a cost effective in investing so uh, co2 capture processes are quite reasonably cost effective and when i say co uh, quite quite cost effective is from the perspective is what legislation government has put for example us and uh, europe has put very stringent legislation so 
uh, industry is already finding it cheaper to capture the CO2 and sequester it rather than uh, venting it to atmosphere and pay penalties. But your question also speaks about uh, is it economical to convert mm -hmm. CO2 to CO? Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Right now, what we can say is that we are more in bench or pilot scale about these processes. Once mm -hmm. this process is successful, as a next step, we will be going into, um, you know, commercial model development of it. What will commercial model <clears throat> include into it? So one of the things which we feel commercial model needs to will be uh, required to include into it is that let us say now I have captured this CO2. Option one, I pay some money and I sequester this CO2 in under the ground. And option two is instead of paying money to get rid of this CO2, I will convert this CO2 into valuable products. So uh, what we feel is that once um, the industry is moving, we might be having you know, CO2 trading in future. For example, we have natural gas oils as of today, uh, natural gas uh, prices or oil prices. We might have CO2 prices in future. So you might be, uh, there might be a day, um, there might be a kind of toll on a regular basis for you to keep putting your CO2 in the pipeline. Because you will not be putting it into weld yourself. There would be some aggregator, somebody like Shell or maybe some other company like Shell, who will be aggregating the CO2 and sequestering it. But you would be the one who would be just capturing it and putting it in the, into the pipeline. But economics would be if when you will find a use like shell reverse water gas shift and fissure drop or methanation process to convert that economically. Right now, the way we are hearing from industry is that these processes seem economically promising. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I just uh, move to very last segment now, mm -hmm. uh, yes, which, is about, mm -hmm. uh, which is about, uh, you know, producing shell blue hydrogen process. So it is for production of blue hydrogen. So first, maybe I will speak about why do we need blue hydrogen? So you see industry is talking about green hydrogen right now or energy transition. We are talking about hydrogen network, but green hydrogen to come economically online, it might take. 15 to 20 years, then what to do until then? So one of the things which industry is looking at is moving into blue hydrogen space. So in this period, we will produce blue hydrogen and build up the whole network. And as and when green hydrogen becomes economically available, it can start transitioning into green hydrogen and we can start moving away from blue hydrogen. So which means that to achieve absolute targets of 2050 or 2070, we might be very small on blue hydrogen, but to reach that journey, we will need a uh, arrangement to be able to handle hydrogen and work on its economics. And uh, when we talk about uh, blue hydrogen, uh, so this is one part. The second thing is how and why we need blue hydrogen. So let us say we just spoke about uh, alternate fuel. For example, we are talking about firing the furnaces. If we are firing the furnaces with fossil fuel, we will continue to emit CO2. We, will con we can continue to capture CO2 and find pathways for CO2. But it becomes a challenge, particularly when we are looking at small, small locations, for example, household, uh, household uh, supply of uh, pipe gas, or when we talk about small industries, it might not be possible to capture CO2 at every small location, which means there is a possibility <clears throat> that we take fossil fuel, we produce blue hydrogen, and then with this blue hydrogen, we supply it to this network where after combustion, they will be, there will be no emission, they will only produce water, and we will be producing blue hydrogen at single location, capturing that whole CO2 at single location in a very economical way and sequestering or further utilizing it. So 
which means that blue hydrogen network we are looking at from the perspective of replacing probably the fossil fuel like uh, natural gas into the pipelines to domestic users or some small industry users. Even for a refinery, sometimes we find that and that is a study going on that there might be a possibility to fire the furnaces. You know, you might have heard of oxy firing. You might have heard of something electric heating of the furnaces. So we are talking about different pathways where we can speak about migrating from fossil fuel burning in furnaces to oxy firing, to, to electrifying or to use hydrogen into it. So there are different economics for different options, but hydrogen seems to be one of the very attractive options uh, after um, natural gas. <clears throat> I have few slides to talk about these processes now, but uh, I would say uh, this would be, from my perspective, one of the important slides in my mind to discuss with you, uh, and I will be open to uh, receive any questions at this point um and any questions from from the participants so far or any comments that, that they like to make no no just this this one slide captures a uh, 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 you know how how you see the the refinery in the new or you know the, the energy in business in in the new era you know uh, very very nature based in a sense yeah, um, may I conclude that? Please, Dr. Ekudin. Yeah, so I think it's very interesting. And then uh, I think you show that there are a lot of pathway that that can be used in the refinery in the future. Um, for example, in terms of the plastic and solid waste or something like that, how is that come up into the scope of the refinery? Because I think it's a little bit well, not common, or maybe it's common in in other countries. I'm not sure because of the the maybe the regulation or some anything that you put like those kind of plastic and municipal waste into the same same scope of the refinery. <coughs> I would be a bit. Uh... Maybe I, I would clarify this point a little bit more. So when, when I speak about plastics, uh, I do feel it is more into refining or petrochemical complex, because even if we do preparation of the feeds, it needs to go back into a steam cracker. So it becomes part of you know refining or petrochemical complex. But when we talk about municipal waste or the biomass waste, and we use process like I8 square, IH square becomes, so IH square kind of process, uh, it gives us liquid fuels, which are uh, very close to naphtha or SAF or renewable diesel, but sometimes they are not exactly on spec. So they will go more as blending material. So which means that IH square unit can be in the, even if it is outside refinery, it needs to be integrated. It, the product of this unit would be off taken by one of the refineries to blend it into their fuels to make it more, uh, to make it low carbon intensity fuel. I, I hope I got your question correct and answer it correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah. And then for the CO2 that um, you said that about the water ship reactor, so now you, I think you are more focused on the syn gas, right? And then I think there's some pathway for the water ship reactor that can go into the uh, hydrogen production or so something like that. Um, be because of some economic problem or something like that, that you didn't put that into like future possible pathway. Um, Actually, you know, the slide has become very busy. We were not able to add a few more things. But there are a few more things we wanted to add. But, you know, this is more about building the flavor. Building the flavor in the sense that there is no clear pathway. We are talking about various options from moving from left to right. There are various developments happening. There are few options which have high TRL technology, but there are many options where the TRL of technology is low because we are into developmental phase. Uh, believe me, there are many other blocks which are possible to put into this slide. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. Very chill. <laughs> if I may. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's very interesting. Thank you very much. I think we have a, a few more minutes for you to to go into a little bit more details if you like, because uh, uh, this is very en enlightening. And again, you know, talking about, I think now we're talking more or less 50 shades of, of hydrogen. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you first started off you know, with, with the blue, with green, with uh, now you have gold and everything. So I uh, would, would, would be would be keen to learn a little bit more about, about hydrogen, please. Thank you very much. Sure. So uh, for hydrogen, um, so Shell has its own blue hydrogen process, which is based on gasification. I'll, I'm just spending few minutes to share with you about what are the different processes we have. So you must be aware that, and everybody is normally aware of SMR, steam methane reforming, and there is there are a lot of projects around it for steam methane reforming to produce blue hydrogen, where uh, the methane is put into uh, you know, feed pretreatment. We go, go into uh, primary reformer, but primary reformer also uses methane as fuel, and we have to emit CO2 from here. Then there is secondary reformer, CO2 shift, again CO2 capture and purification to produce hydrogen. While in ATR, the change which is happening is that instead of adding um, steam, uh, in, uh, instead of adding only steam we are also adding oxygen to the uh, process, which means it reduces the CO2 emission from the primary reformer system. And then we again have um, CO2 capture after CO2 shift and purification. These are the two processes not really owned by Shell. It is from our competition, but uh, I just wanted to give you a quick comparison of how do we compare with Shell gasification process. Shell gasification process does not need any pretreatment because there is no catalyst involved. So the natural gas can be directly fed into the gasifiers. We put oxygen through the ASU, similar to ATR. We produce very large quantity of steam here. And after CO shift con conversion, we capture CO2. So which means there is again a CO2 capture here, but there is no CO2 capture coming from the uh, flue gases from reformer. So what was happening was, uh, I'm just for the paucity of time, I am just using a few slides to talk through. What was happening was until now we were seeing the SMR to be very attractive option to make uh, blue hydrogen, to make hydrogen, to make gray hydrogen. Because if you see the green line sits here, while for pox process, shell gasification process, the green line sits much away above, which means that when we were looking at producing hydrogen uh, from, from natural gas, SMR was very attractive because there was no penalty for venting the CO2. But now when we are looking in an environmental friendly way, I want to produce green hydrogen, then I must, all, uh, blue hydrogen, then I must also look what is the overall CO2 footprint of this uh, hydrogen and what is the CO2 capture cost. So when we built in this CO2 capture cost into uh, the SMR, uh, we find that the POX process or shell blue hydrogen process becomes very cost effective as compared to gray hydrogen, uh, as compared to SMR. So this gray section is blue hydrogen, though we say gray hydrogen from SMR, but if we try to make blue hydrogen and we increase the capex over here, you see, we are increasing the capex over here uh, to, uh, uh, my apology, we are increasing the capex over here, we are increasing the opex, we are reducing the gas demand, we still have some residual CO2, but the process becomes very cost effective when we produce blue hydrogen from box process. And this is something which we were presenting to our customers from for past few months, but our customers honestly were not convinced because everybody saw SMR as the hydrogen production tool. But this is now supported by, uh, you know, IEA, which is an independent um, international organization for environment in, uh, international environment assessment who have given this report 
and where they have come up with partial oxidation to be very cost effective. Uh, there is a full report about it. If you will note the report number, you can you know directly find it on the internet. So it is not something which Shell has done. It is a uh, it is a neutral report. And if you see the report, you will see that Fox produces uh, Fox has the lowest CO2 footprint, which is 2.43 kg per CO2 uh, uh, kg CO2 equivalent per kg of hydrogen vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, ATR, SMR processes. Um, and uh, this also becomes cost effective because if we take CO2 abatement cost, which includes CO2 capture, CO2 um, aggregation, transportation, and sequestration altogether going to approximately $100 per ton. We find boxes between 9 to 25 um, percent lower than, you know, steam uh, methane reformer or electrical methane reformer. Uh, where, uh, okay, so I didn't speak about it. ESMR is electrical steam methane reformer, where on the uh, for the heating of the tube side of the primary reformer, we don't use natural gas. We use um, electrical energy coming from renewable grid. But the box still remains very cost effective in this case. So this was uh, uh, something very uh, quick about uh, box process. Uh, we have a couple of examples where we are using uh, Shell's partial oxidation process. 18 SGB trains are in pole GTL process in Qatar, where after primary reforming, uh, after, uh, after partial oxidation and production of hydrogen, we are actually using Fisher prop to produce, um, you know, uh, the, the clean fuels from it. Not green fuels, but the clean fuels, because the starting point is still natural gas. And also we are building 1 million ton per year of CO2 capture facility uh, in Pernis right now. So these are this is the combination of process where we are using partial oxidation and CO2 capture to produce uh, blue hydrogen. Uh, maybe you will have questions and I would like to answer up front is that we don't have right now reference of producing blue hydrogen by partial oxidation uh, because uh, blue hydrogen is very new thing, but we have a lot of um, Fox processes running, more than 100 uh, gasifiers running worldwide, and we have multiple uh, units using uh, CO2 capture process, which is used in partial oxidation or blue hydrogen process. Um, what uh, CO2 capture process is used? I will just speak about it very quickly. So Shell has two uh, CO2 capture processes. One is called EDIP Ultra or pre-combustion CO2 capture process. And one is Kensol CO2 capture, which is post-combustion. And both these units are running at 1 million ton capacity in commercial operation, one in Quest in Canada and one in Boundary Dam project in Canada. Uh, just to speak about where to use ADIP and where to use Kensol. So ADIP process or pre-combustion process can be used only when we have a high pressure CO2 stream containing no oxygen. But if we have any other stream, whether at low pressure or with pressure of oxygen, presence of oxygen, we need to use Kensol process. So this is the kind of two uh, technologies which we have, which can cover any kind of CO2 emission stream to capture CO2. Uh, just to talk more about uh, Kensol CO2 capture process, this process is very uh, widely used for different kind of emissions, like you can see whether it is combined cycle gas plant having very low concentration of CO2 and very low contaminants to a process like semen kiln of gases carrying high CO2 concentration and having all different kinds of large quantities of contaminants in it. We use same process, but we use pretreatment, of course, and produce same quality of CO2 starting from any kind of feed stream. 
I'm just being mindful of time. So yes, we we have uh, only five minutes left, yeah. I believe. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going through one question, uh, which uh, uh, Doctor Egbodin has asked, and I'm just going about CO2 utilization options. So what is happening is that when we talk about CO2 utilization and sequestration, what we feel is even if we look at utilization by utilization, number one, we have to add a large quantity of energy to break this very stable CO2 molecule. We produce a product or service, but in the end, this product or service after use is going to produce CO2 again and will need CO2 sink. So which means that and that is why probably right now a big focus is to look at CO2 and storage, but doesn't mean that we are not working on these two options. These are being worked based on economics and CO2 footprint. Because we are also observing when you want to produce um, intermediate products which are starting from CO2, they also carry their own CO2 footprints. So we have to look at from two perspectives. One is from the economics perspective and also from the perspective of uh, overall, overall environmental impact of having those products. So uh, these are kind of different utilization options which people are talking about and they are in different domains. So on left side, you will see capital requirement and risk and on the right side, you will see what is the development stage? So when you say mature markets, what we are doing is we are using CO2 for enhanced oil recovery. So I'm not talking about sequestration here. I'm also only talking about what are the utilization options. So CO2 is being used from in, for enhanced oil recovery from the wells for quite some time now. CO2 is used for production of urea and methanol. And CO2 is also being used for greenhouses. I missed to speak about it when I was talking about our own refinery in Pernice, that one of the CO2 usage, usage which we are doing in Netherlands is we are supplying this CO2 to nearby greenhouses where they are using this CO2 inside. They are injecting the CO2 inside CO2, um, greenhouses to increase the uh, CO2 availability to plants and which helps them produce you know, larger uh, fruits or vegetables. I'm afraid uh, we, we may be cut off at, at uh, from two minutes from now. Okay. So uh, uh, if, if, if you may, uh, please uh, just wrap up. Sorry about that. But again, you no. know, it's very, very uh, informative and, and it's packed with information. Thank you very much. Uh, just I will just say that uh, there are different pressures on different organizations to go through the CO2 transition. Mm -hmm. I believe a lot of people in this group today, as well as industries in Thailand, need to go through it. Shell can work with you uh, to help develop those decarbonization pathways. Uh, we have various technologies, but not to worry. Even if we don't have technology, we can still help develop the pathway and uh, we can bring in the technologies, even if those are not owned by Shell. So that's kind of very broad summary point from my slide side. OK, thank, thank you very much. We seem to have a little bit of a hiccups and even I was uh, kicked off <laughs> and now I'm using my colleagues uh, computer just uh, so uh, on behalf of Carbon Markets Club. Uh, very grateful for, for your presentation and uh, also uh, thank you very much Kun Chan Chai from Chao Thailand to who facilitate this and uh, I'm really uh, I'm really sorry for the participants that you know the session has been a little bit of, of uh, on and off and uh, it has become much shorter than we have expected but I do hope that you get the uh, the sense of how the world is moving towards a, a you know a low carbon economy and especially the decarbonized uh, energy industry and and Shell has a a lot of uh, technologies and experience to share and 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 uh, we really appreciate that and we hope to be able to share with you or having you share with us more in the near future ก็ขอบพระคุณทุกท่านนะคะแล้วก็พบกันใหม่ในโอกาสหน้านะคะเราทางคาร์บอนมาร์เก็ตคลับก็จะสื่อสารให้ทราบว่าเว็บบินาร
ขอบคุณครับสวัสดีครับ